Hello there folks. Somebody sent me a really nice email today saying that my videos had gotten him through some hard times and, and I really appreciate that. That's uh, it's not the first time somebody has said that to me and I I understand it because you know whenever I have some difficulties sometimes some YouTuber talking about random stuff has really helped me uh, get a, a grip on things and this is one of the reasons I've felt that entertainment is an important thing you know that we we kind of poo poo entertainers and artists as being you know sort of uh, non-essential workers but i don't think that's true i think uh, entertainers and artists do something for the community that's really important and i'm glad to be able to do it so i thought i'd mention that also speaking of arts and entertainment here is <laughs> so the latest iteration of my new book not really, but one of the things I do when I'm writing a book is after I have a certain number of chapters or chapterlets or almost chapters completed, I make a list of them and then try to put them into an order and then I try to work with them in that order to see if that works and of course I have to shuffle them around and stuff. But I've got uh, th 36 plus 37, 38, 39, 40, 40, 40, 42. <laughs> Ooh, that's an interesting number. 42 chapters. Actually, I should try to stick with 42 chapters for those of you who understand the reference. Uh, also mentioning again our retreat, the fall retreat, which is accessible online for the first time ever. You can find out information at accc.org for where you can sign up for that. Also, uh, we're on uh, the Zooms uh, at uh, Angel City Zen Center uh, at least four or five times a week. You can find information on that. Everybody is welcome to join. That's a new thing we've uh, put up, and I plan to continue it, you know, as long as uh, people still want to keep joining us on Zoom. So, what I wanted to talk to you about today is this article that I just found called The Ethics of Action. This, I've probably read this a long time ago. It is by Nishijima Roshi, my teacher, and I'll put a link to where you can find it. You can uh, find a lot of things by Nishijima Roshi on shobogenzo.net, which is Mike Lutchford, one of his students, put together this website with a lot of resources, including a few videos where I am asking Nishijima Roshi questions. It just so happens that I'm in there and I'm the one asking questions. It's not videos of me asking questions, but that was interesting to me because I can look at myself in the 1990s. Well, sometimes I can. Anyway, you don't usually see me, but occasionally you see me. Anyway, uh, in the 1990s, asking Nishijima Roshi questions about life, the universe, and everything. So this is Ethics of Action, and this is something I'm planning to try to summarize for this book. So that'll be another chapter, so I'll have to renumber them again. But it's, it's an interesting little paper. It's something he said all the time. It's, it's kind of a compilation of things he, he said all the time. <laughs> First off, he says he divides ethics into two basic categories of the ethics as he sees them in you know practice in the world uh, one is ethics based on mind and the other is ethics based on the senses ethics based on mind or idealistic ethics are the kind of ethics that we are most familiar with and which are described by most religions they are standards of what is right and wrong what is good and bad they are always defined in some absolute sense which when we try to follow them are the goal of religious life. Uh, that's one. Ethics based on the senses needs a little more explanation, he says. Usually the materialistic standpoint posits that what is comfortable is good and what is uncomfortable is bad. In other words, the materialist seeks comfort and wants to escape discomfort. We would not normally refer to this as an ethical criterion, and indeed materialistic thinkers generally have strongly denied the value of ethical criteria and moral laws. But I believe that even the denial of ethical criteria is itself an ethical criterion. And so I think that there does exist a materialistic ethical criterion. That's, <laughs> that's kind of typical Nishijima Roshi grammar. Uh, this looks like somebody's fixed up the grammar, but uh, that's really, uh, that's the way he used to talk. Now he says he derives a lot of what he's going to say about ethics from a certain passage in Genjo Koan, and it's a bit long, so I'm going to try to read it quickly 
and uh, this is Genjo Kon, this is Dogen's, probably his most famous piece of writing. When fish swim in water, though they keep swimming, there is no end to the water. When birds fly in the sky, though they keep flying, there is no end to the sky. At the same time, fish and birds have never left the water or the sky. When the activity is great, usage is great. When the necessity is small, usage is small. Acting in this state, none fails to realize its limitations at every moment, and none fails to somersault freely at every place. But if a bird leaves the sky, it will die at once, and if a fish leaves the water, it will die at once. So we can understand that the water is life and that the sky is life. Birds are life and fish are life. It may be that life is birds and life is fish. Good line. Please remember that one. And beyond this, there may still be further progress. This being so, a bird or fish that tried to understand the water or the sky completely before swimming or flying could never find its way or find its place in the water or in the sky. When we find this place, this action inevitably realizes the universe. When we find this way, this action is inevitably the state of the realized universe itself. And there's more to it than that, but I'll stop there because it's a long quote. But what uh, Nishijima Roshi says is, Our daily lives are an endless continuum of action. But action always takes place in surroundings. Without the surroundings, the action cannot continue because the surroundings always appear with the action. They are in divisible. So this is an important point because we often imagine that we are sort of actors on this blank stage and that the stage is something separate from us. But what Nishijima Roshi is saying here and what Dogen often said and what a lot of Buddhist philosophers say is that the place in which we act and ourselves who are acting are one indivisible unity, not separate things. And this is important. He also says, and this I like, our action always fills up the universe, and we are always free in the state of action, which is wonderful. He, he never got, Nishijima Roshi didn't get very mystical sounding. You know, he was very interested in talking in a kind of a concrete way as a way to kind of be counter to the tendency of, uh, of certain people in the, you know, the Eastern spirituality realm to, to sound all, all high and, and crazy and weird and, and mystical. Um, and, and so he tended not to say things like that, but there was that side to him. And, and I think like Dogen, he was a mystical realist. Now, here is him explaining the Dogen quote. Master Dogen says that if we human beings want to realize completely what the circumstances are before we act, we will never be able to act and we will never be able to find our way to find our place. So that's what he's referring to when he says the, the fish who tries to completely understand water or the bird that tries to completely understand the sky. We are always in a state of kind of unknowing. So ethical action always takes place in a state where Cognitively, at least, you're, you're not going to figure it out. And if you're going to try to figure it all out before you act, you'll never act at all. But in finding this place, Nishijima Roshi says, action makes the universe real. And in finding this way, action is always the state of the great universe made real. This way and this place are not concepts to be described with words like great or small. They are not subjective or objective. They are not states which have existed since the past, nor do they appear in the present. They are just in front of us, evident here and now like this. And that's what he really believed and pushed, this idea that everything that we need to do ethically is, is kind of a big neon light-up sign in front of us telling us exactly what we ought to do, but we still miss that because we've got these blinders on and the blinders are the sort of materialistic outlook or the idealistic outlook. Maybe that's one way to put it. Now skipping on down a lot of stuff to the bottom, we get this line. Action is the oneness between subject and object. Action is not only subjective and not only objective, rather it is just the oneness between subject and object. When we are acting sincerely, it is difficult for us to see ourselves, subject, as separate from the external world on which we are acting, object. So that's another one of these things. Now, what I like about it 
is he takes something that is often phrased by other Buddhist speakers in a sort of mystical fashion, which makes it kind of sound like something crazy and out there, and he puts it in very concrete terms. Action is where subject and object don't uh, come together, <laughs> don't, don't divide. So the division between subject and object is in our minds, in our heads, in our specific thinking cognitive minds. In the real world, there is no difference between uh, object and subject, and action is where that takes place. So he was all about action as the main criteria for life, the universe, and everything. And he says, according to the viewpoint that I've just described, that our life is just action, we can see that for Buddhism, the most valuable thing in this world is just to do right and not to do wrong. It sounds pretty simple, but it's not simple. And he gives the conversation that's recorded in Dogen's Shoakumaksa, a.k.a. Don't Be a Jerk, in which I forget who is asking who, but the, the monk asks the master, or, or I think it's a, a learned poet and somebody who's uh, very uh, smart asks the Zen master, what's the real criterion of Buddhism? And the master says, just do right, don't do wrong. The learned guy says, well, even a three-year-old child could say that. And then in response to that, the master says, well, yeah, even a three-year-old child can say it, but even an elderly person has difficulty practicing it. And that's, that's the thing, practicing it, putting it into action, into action at this moment. So ethics based on action is ethics that are right here and now at this time. So this means you are, the, the idea that you can do something violent or evil now as a way to create some good in the future, it's taken away for Buddhists. And I think that's really important, and that's something that a lot of Buddhists, uh, I think, are, are kind of forgetting lately. You have to take the right action right now at this moment, and you have to see how the karma that you create now is, is very important, is, is more important than the ideal that you have for the future or, or something like that. It's the, it's the actual karma that you're creating right now, uh, your interaction with the person or object object right in front of you. That is the criteria for right action. And that is the criteria for ethical action and ethics in action. So I hope you enjoyed that. I made it a little bit short. If you want to donate to me, you can donate via PayPal and Patreon at the links you're seeing below. Or if you're on YouTube, the links will be in the description on the YouTube video. Thank you very much. Your uh, contributions are what keep me going uh, much more than any other source of income I have. And I thank you very much. If you're having financial trouble, don't donate to me because I'm not desperate. But uh, the reason I'm not desperate is because people continue to donate, and I thank you very much for that. I will put a link to the Nishijima Roshi paper below so you can see the whole thing if you want. And I'm going to go in uh, right now after I finish editing this video and putting up and work on writing a chapter about that for my book, and wish me luck. See you later. Have a good time all the time. Bye.